welcome. Happy almost end of Sundance and happy almost Lunar New Year. Um, I am Nicole Chen. I am one of the leadership team members of ADOC. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, thank you to Jua and Lailani who are who helped organize this event and will be posting um, some information, more information in the chat. Um, so I'm Nicole Chen. I'm dialing in from Lenape land in Queens, New York. Um, I am a 30 something year old Asian American woman, uh, East Asian woman with longish two toned hair. Um, in front of this red background for New Year's, also for a little holiday um, festivities. I'm so excited uh, to be in conversation with a selection of our members with films playing at the festival. Um, we couldn't have everybody join us today, so um, you know, Lailani will drop something in the chat, uh, a little guide to all of our members that are participating at the festival. Um, but yeah, I guess without further ado, um, sorry, let me just backtrack one second. Um, just wanted folks also to be aware, um, we are going to be using Sundance's community agreements, um, which will be also made available in the chat. So please note that this ch the chat functions will be monitored. If you feel like if there's any kind of infringement of these agreements, please DM Lailani or Jua. We want to try and keep things kind of respectful in this place. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to start with just a little conversation with our panelists and then we'll kind of jump into a Q&A. So please use that Q&A box function and we will get to your questions. Um, so yes, without further ado, uh, can we have all of our panelists come back on camera? And we'll have you all introduce yourselves and your projects. Uh, Shalini, do you want to get started? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, my name is uh, Shalini Kintaya. I'm the director of a film called Tick Tock Boom um, that premiered um, this year at Sundance. And um, the film is about uh, Gen Z influencers and sort of the film explores how a um, a social media app that's, you know, sort of best known for teenagers dancing becomes the center of a geopolitical controversy. Thank you. Maria? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Chu. I go by she, her pronouns. I have black hair. Uh, um, I'm wearing a knit sweater and a, a green necklace with a white background. Um, I come to you in uh, the Chumash a native lands, also known as LA, my hometown. And I'm here with the film, uh, The Exiles, that I'm super proud of. I am a co-producer along with the directors for the film. And it's a, it's a film about Christine Choi, a magnanimous person, such a character, and a documentary filmmaker that everyone should know. Thank you. Michaela, let's go to you next. Cool. Hi, my name is Michaela Ternaski Holland. I am uh, a mixed race woman with dark hair. Uh, I'm also wearing a knit sweater like Maria. We kind of almost look like doppelgangers right now because they both have little turtlenecks on them. Um, I'm behind me is a blurred out living room. I'm sort of sitting on the floor because I get the best lighting here near the window, so I'm not backlit. Um, so I'm sitting on the floor behind me is my couch um, and you can kind of see the kitchen like way off in the background with the lights on, but it's all blurred out. And I uh, go by the pronouns she, her, sometimes they, them. And my story or my project that I'm bringing here today is called On the Morning You Wake to the End of the World. It's a three part virtual, virtual reality documentary experience. And it takes place in Hawaii during the false ballistic missile alert that happened in 2018. The project showcases the threat of nuclear weapons in our day-to-day -day lives, even if it has become an invisible issue um, for the government to discuss. And it takes you on a deep and personal journey through the moments in time when these 
uh, Hawaiian citizens, both indigenous as well as uh, non-indigenous folks uh, received this message and the thoughts and the actions they took after receiving the message. Thank you. And finally, Julie and Eugene. Hi there, I'm Julie Ha. Um, I go by she, her pronouns. I'm sitting in my living room with uh, my fireplace mantle in the background and a free Chelsea Lee poster from, from the movement days. Um, yeah, our, uh, Eugene and my project is Free Chelsea Lee. Uh, it's a documentary film about um, a Korean immigrant who was wrongly convicted of murder in the 1970s. Uh, a Korean immigrant journalist um, breaks the case wide open and triggers a landmark movement of Asian Americans to free him from death row. Uh, and they remarkably, they, they win, they succeed in doing that. But once out, we find that Chul Su Lee is not truly free. Oh, oh. you're muted. Last but not least, Eugene. Ah, and <clears throat> someone had to do it. Um, I am Eugene Yi. I'm also one of the directors of Free Shal Su Lee. Uh, go by he, him pronouns on the unceded land of the Munsee Lenape, otherwise known as Palisades Park, New Jersey. Um, and as mentioned, I am uh, also one of the directors of Free Shal Su Lee. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm a 40 something East Asian American man with a burgundy shirt and glasses and a beard in front of a mostly white background with a stripe of of foliage uh, wallpaper behind me. Love it. My background is slightly to hide my messy room in the back. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited to, to be with you all here today. And, you know, kind of we're, we're winding down Sundance at this point. So I would love to take a temperature check to see how your how your virtual experience has been going premiering your projects. I know we were really looking forward to, you know, being in person and I feel like I've done a lot more in the virtual space than I probably would have in person and definitely more than I did last year. So um, this is question open to anybody who wants to kind of, yeah, just recap how their their past two weeks have been going. <laughs> who wants to take this? I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's been quite the whirlwind, obviously, and maybe, I don't know if the other filmmakers could identify with this, but um, we were really scrambling actually to finish the film in time <laughs> for Sundance. Um, and so it, it was like, that was very um, exhausting as well. And then, and then to have the actual Sundance experience, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a thrill. It's been an honor. Um, and, and then at the same time, overwhelming and exhausting. Um, but I, and it, it was heartbreaking not being able to go to Sundance. I don't, I don't know if the others felt the same way, but at the same time, like we realized um, going virtual also probably um, allowed the, the film to reach like even more people too um, and more audiences. And we've been, uh, Eugene and I have just been, we've sort of been just been like humbled and, and blown away by the response we've gotten. Um, from people who have seen it and it, especially from actually the, the people who are involved in the movement um, who have really embraced the film and, and feel like we, we actually captured Chosuli, the person and then also the movement. And that's, that's, been, that's been hugely just gratifying, yeah. And Michaela, I'm curious for you, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, what, your your project since it's in the new frontiers um category uh how yeah how folks have been you know how you've been able to kind of interact with audiences in that way too totally so um i think the interesting point is because the project is a vr piece and because it's in the new frontier category we actually were anticipating a pivot a digital pivot because we already knew we would have sort of online virtual events happening because of what Sundance has built, which is called the spaceship. So the spaceship is basically this really fun, interactive, people kind of call it like a networking platform. Sundance created this platform actually for Sundance 2021. And um, a lot of us who work in VR are very used to these types of platforms. And we know that 
for a lot of people who might have experienced it on desktop. Our journalists, our press who have headsets, were very inclined to actually jump into headset and experience it as a full body social experience too, because that was what a lot of us did in 2021 who had virtual reality headsets. So we were already set up to have an online artist spotlight in the spaceship. And we were already set up to have an in-person artist spotlight in the craft, which was the in-person venue. So when Sundance went on fully virtual, we sort of didn't see it as a loss necessarily because we still gained our online artist spotlight that we'd already pre-recorded the panel. We had already sort of had that done and, and ready to go. And we already knew that a lot of the journalists weren't feeling comfortable traveling. They knew they could just travel basically to their Sundance in New Frontier and headset, which was really helpful as well. But you do still miss that magic. And it's almost like the inverse of filmmaking because in filmmaking you're like oh the screening only happens for a very small group of people and then now that it's online so many more people can watch it by buying a ticket and the opposite happens for virtual reality because in virtual reality you're like oh my gosh I'm so excited it's going to be there in person with headsets for people who don't have headsets and so then people who don't have headsets get to come watch it and then when it goes fully online you kind of go oh no like those people who don't have headsets are now at a loss because they can't access my film. So it's a very interesting like inverse reaction that happens. So in our pivot, we decided we were going to ship out headsets to people and partners that we really wanted to make sure they got to see the film because they because we knew it was first like a step in solidarity for them to showcase that we really wanted them to feel like they were still invested in the project and that they got to be a part of the project. Um, but we also had to create what's called like a headset capture version of the experience to showcase that to our collaborators in Hawaii because we had a plan to go to Hawaii and like showcase it in headset pre -sundance. So. It's almost like we're better set up to pivot digitally, but then on the other hand, there's a little bit of that like give and take you get with taking a virtual reality experience and making it fully digital. So I think it's very interesting and a little ironic. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Maria Shalini. I, I honestly, this has been my first venture into the, uh, metaverse and the spaceship is very cool. I, I created my little avatar um, and I just, if the world is going that way, I am a little nervous for myself, but it's been an interesting and fun experience. Shalini, anything you wanna add? to how you're, how you're from? Okay, great. Um, so let's, let's kind of backtrack now. How, how did you get involved in your, in your project? What, what inspired you all to kind of tell the stories that you wanted to tell? Um, Shalini, do you want to start, kick us off with that? Well, I think I was just fascinated with this app that had sort of eclipsed Facebook and also fascinated by Gen Z taking to TikTok and the way in which, um, it also just fascinated with, with the first generation of human beings that sort of came of age online, who grew up online, and the way that that is changing our humanity. And, um, and then, you know, during the pandemic, like everyone else, I started using TikTok <laughs> and became very addicted very quickly. I mean, it, and was also just astounded by how well it, the algorithm knew me. And, um, and then at the same time, because I had just done a film on algorithms. <laughs> I um, called coded bias that was here um, in 2020. I, I, I sort of um, was thinking about what is the impact of these really powerful persuasive recommendation algorithms on young people and you know what are the stories behind it and um, when I set out to make the film, I really knew that Gen Z influencers were going to be the, the main characters in the film to take us through this story because it's a world I feel like only they are authorities on. And, um, 
And that's how I found the three main characters of the, of the film. Mm-hmm. Who wants to take a stab next? <laughs> Julie, go for okay. it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, yes, a free chill Suli. Um, Eugene and I have actually known about the story for quite a long time um, through the journalist K.W. Lee, who is one of the main characters in her film. It's his stories that, you know, spark the movement. Um, He's actually, he's a very influential figure for both of us. Um, For me personally, I met him when I was 18 years old and he inspired me to become a journalist. Um, And he's quite the force of nature if you ever have the privilege of meeting him in your life. Um, He's, you know, when you're 18 years old and you meet, um, the first journalist you meet is this Korean immigrant like who curses like every other word who you find out covered the Jim Crow South and that, you know, he could write stories that um, could propel a movement to free a wrongly convicted Korean man from death row. It changes your entire worldview, you know, Um, it changes your life. And that's what it did for me. Um, And I think I always knew the power of this story uh, from a young age, but I, I would never have thought to make a film, <laughs> period. I had no aspirations to be a filmmaker. I'm a print journalist. Um, I love being a journalist, but it was my friend Eugene Yee here. Um, we, we worked together for a long time as journalists um, for Korean American Magazine. And, um, and so it was really, you know, that, that relationship with Eugene and my relationship with KW um, that made even this film uh, possible. Um, the idea wasn't really sparked, I would say, until I attended the funeral of Chul Lee in 2014. And um, I didn't really know it at the time, though. Um, basically, while I was at that funeral, um, I felt uh, this overwhelming sense of heaviness. And it was um, an emotion that was far beyond grief. The people at the funeral were mostly the activists who had come to Chul aid and K.W. Lee. And they were expressing um, such deep regret that they hadn't done enough to save Chul Suli, even though they had dedicated years and years of their lives to freeing a stranger. Um, And many of them spent years of their lives trying to help him as he struggled um, upon reentering society. Um, And that they're saying that they didn't do enough. And um, and KW that was there and he was in such anguish and he he cried out like, why is this story still underground? You know, a landmark movement of Asian Americans and people don't know about it. It got buried in history. And, um, and so that heaviness stayed with me for a long time. And so almost a year later when Eugene and I were talking about making a film together, you know, um, I told him about that heaviness and we just both knew we, we had to, we had to, we had to, we had to dig in. We had to, you know, he, he and I have always really been passionate about Asian American stories that are complex and nuanced. And, and we just knew we, we had to like tell the story. We could not let it remain buried in history. It was too important and too consequential. And so, and so we did, we, we just, we honestly felt like it beckoned us and it needed a release. And uh, if I could just add, yes, uh, Julie and I, we, we worked together at Coriam Journal, the Korean American magazine, um, where um, I had written um, just sort of long form pieces uh, with them. And Julie is an amazing print editor and our collaboration was always really fruitful. So that's why I wanted to work with her again once the magazine folded. Um, and as an extension of that work, um, covering stories in our communities that um, wouldn't otherwise get covered. Uh, but I also had a, a foot in, in video editing, Maria and and my paths have actually crossed in the past, um, just in New York and just um, those circles. And so, so that's the background that I was coming from. And uh, once we started, decided to start working on the film, I mean, it was amazing because KW introduced us to a lot of the key figures who were involved in the movement. And each of them, it was amazing. Each of them had a box or, or, or something in the attic or in, in a garage somewhere that contained artifacts from the movement. And that included video footage and audio recordings of Chul Su Lee. I mean, we particularly have to thank Sandra Jin, who did one of the first pieces on Chul Su Lee at the time, 
who actually had to fight and struggle mightily to get a piece um, like a magazine style piece done about him um, and who continued to follow his story over the years. And we really wouldn't have a film without her work. Um, but through just being able to gather these archives, it was it was it was incredible. I mean, we saw one that there'd be enough to make a film about Chelsu, like we really feel his presence and hear his voice. But secondly, it just really became apparent how important just the act of archiving is, particularly for communities that are not part of the mainstream white narrative or the mainstream narrative in any way. And particularly, you know, for our communities, which weren't as well covered without sort of a certain lens being used to see our communities. And that really is just a testament to all of the journalists and the reporters and the filmmakers, activists, everybody at the time who was involved because they made a decision to hang on to their material and without them, yeah, there wouldn't be a film. I, I want to revisit collaboration um, in a little bit, but uh, Michaela and Maria, uh, how did you come to work on your on your films? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, so I actually got a phone call from one of the directors of The Exiles um, a year and a half ago, and they had found me because of a short film that I had worked on with one of my co-directors. Uh, and so basically I did not have a lot of information about the film except for the fact that it was a film about Christine Choi and I knew her work from Who Killed Vincent Chin. Um, I haven't seen, I didn't know her at all, but I knew that I wanted to be a part of, you know, raising a voice to a woman who has done incredible work throughout her life. I mean, she's done hundreds of films. Um, but I didn't know her personally. So honestly, I just kind of signed up with this, this hope that I could be helpful in some way. Uh, the directors had already shot four to five years worth of footage with her. And they were at a point where they really wanted to figure out how to get to the end of, of the film, right? Um, so that's when I came on. So I co-produced this along with the directors. Um, and then when I first saw the footage of Christine, I was like, wow, like what a, what a person that I wish I had grown up seeing. Um, and so it just brings me so much joy uh, because I know the thing in my mind, one of the footage that I first had seen is this photo of Christine Choi. I think it was in some, sometime in the eighties and she has this gigantic camera on her shoulder. And this is when she's filming 16 millimeters. You know, like I just have never seen this, you know, Asian woman with with a perm and this huge camera. And I was like, this is the reason why I will do what it takes to get it done. Um, and I've just been so lucky to work with a great team. Uh, and I think we're really, really proud of how it came out. Call you, Michaela. Um, so I have a very similar story to Maria, where the project was sort of underway when I was before I was brought on. Um, the project originated in 2018 when Dr. Alexander Glasser and Tamara Patton, uh, who were studying at Princeton University and running a organization for Princeton called the Science and Global Security. Um, they realized that there was a real power in virtual reality storytelling, especially because their focus was helping people understand the issue around nuclear weapons, the threat of nuclear weapons, and help incite action for people to feel that they could get involved in the eradication of nuclear weapons as a whole across the world. So they approached uh, Games for Change, which is an incredible organization that focuses on exactly on what they say, games and interactive media and immersive media for impact and change. And they decided to continue this project under a MacArthur grant and Games for Change, knowing that they have a very deep root in XR is what we call the virtual reality, augmented reality field. We don't really call it the metaverse, we call it XR. Metaverse is sort of a new term that's been brought up thanks to Facebook. and. That not that we won't stop anyone from calling it the metaverse because we know what you what what it means. We just we just feel like the metaverse doesn't exactly exist quite yet because of the way the technology has not quite yet evolved. Just to a small aside, so in the XR field of the metaverse industry, um, there's a documentary called Notes on Blindness, and this is considered sort of the Citizen Kane of virtual reality. And Notes on Blindness 
was a collaboration between Archer's Mark, which is a very well-known British documentary and British media making studio um, at, with Atlas V or Atlas V, um, which is a very well-known French um, studio. The French studio really focused on the innovation and the um, virtual reality development and the Archer's Mark really focuses on the story. And so Games for Change was actually the root of why these two people came back together, these two entities came back together to create their sophomore debut. Um, and this is that project. So these are the creators of Notes on Blindness, virtual reality experience, as well as Notes on Blindness. There's a full documentary as well. Um, so, I was actually in the audience at the Games for Change Festival in 2018 when they announced this project. And at that time, I had just recently left my position at Time Magazine, where I worked on a lot of the immersive interactive content. I had just premiered my own personal project at Sheffield DocFest, which was great, but then I realized the collaborators didn't want to continue the project. So I was fairly lost, as we all tend to be, I think, in this field every now and again, wondering what could be next for me. And never in a million years did I think that this project that was announced in 2018, pre-pandemic, I got to watch a panel with Susanna, with the creators, with all the people involved, that I would come in later. So cut to post-2020, cut to post uh, the project is about to premiere at Sundance, and they're looking for an impact producer. So one of the things that you have to think about if you're interested in virtual reality experience making is that it, it takes a little bit more effort, not just to make the project, but also to distribute the project and to think about how that project is going to be distributed. So with film, once you have a completed project and once that project you know, exists under a specific distributor or, or, or whatnot, you can basically send the file to any university, you can send the file to any um, sort of organization that wants to screen the project, right? Like most people have a laptop they can watch the project on. Most people have a, a nice projector or some sort of like TV screen. It's, it's not a, a huge lift in the technological field for people to see a documentary film, which is amazing. With VR, you really have to think about what is the strategic way we are going to make sure people see this film and take action around this film, even if it's a virtual reality experience. And so that's where my job comes in. And that's sort of where my positioning comes in. Um, the beauty of what attracted me to saying yes to this project wasn't just because of the big names involved, but because one of the um, promises I made to myself was that I was going to continue telling stories about people that look like me and are around my age. And what's a beautiful thing about this story is that it's truly universal and it takes place in Hawaii. So there are people who are, have Asian descent, uh, indigenous descent, non-indigenous, non-Asian descent, but the piece itself, right? Imagining waking up one morning and receiving a text message alert on your phone that says incoming ballistic, incoming ballistic, ballistic missile, seek shelter, this is not a drill. And you literally have the last few moments of what it is that you should be feeling before you receive the follow-up message 38 minutes later that says, just not a drill, just kidding. This is actually you know, an, a mistake on our end. And, and I think that that bringing into the light something that we think is archaic, you know, the 80s and the 60s and the issues around nuclear weapons have kind of gone dormant, especially here in the US. And it's great to bring this back to the forefront. Um, it's great to bring this back to the forefront now because there is a treaty that the United Nations signed and the four or five countries that, that have not yet signed it and have not put it into force is the United States, the UK, French, Germany, Japan of all places. And so I think it's hopeful to know that this project can potentially be a spark to help usher in the continuation of the eradication of nuclear weapons. And that's what excites me about the project and all the fun things we have planned for it. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. And I think that's a great uh, way to kind of pivot to my next question, um, which is about kind of your your approach to storytelling and, and your, your process. And uh, Shalini, I would love to start with you. I know, I know we don't have too much time left with you. You have another panel with our partners at Firelight. Um, so if you wanna kick off that question, how, how did you approach telling, you know, your filmmaking process for TikTok Boom? Well, this story was sort of large and, and sprawling. And so I really sought characters that 
whose lives had changed because of the app and whose personal stories intersect with like larger political themes um, so that I could interweave these things that seemingly don't fit together. Um, and then, you know, sort of visually, one of the things that I was dealing with is, um, uh, I don't know if you can hear that. There's like a, a, a traffic jam of New York City going outside my window. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> it's the charming city that I live in. Um, but, but basically, um, uh, one of the things I, I had to deal with in the film is um, TikTok as this short video narrative and how that fit inside of cinema, like the larger cinematic language of the film. And I think that um, one of the things that we talked about was like how to use that vertical scroll and how to create a visual style that felt very distorted and like not everything is as it should be. And I'm really sorry for that traffic jam. Could you hear that? Just a little, just a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, uh, that this question is open up to other folks too. I don't know, Maria, if you want to talk about, um, yeah, like your, your, your approach coming on as a producer. Yeah, um, I can't really speak to visual style as much as the directors and the cinematographer. Uh, so Ben, Violet, and Connor, I, I know they were very um, purposeful in how they shot Christine because we were trying to marry Christine Choi's, um, you know, getting getting the audience to understand who she is and what a figure she is. I mean, she kind of jumps off the screen, so like it's it's easy, but also to integrate the story of the exiles, the three exiles, and you know the whole history of Tiananmen Square is is still something that I am learning. I think we've all learned so much through making of this film, um, and so it's to be able to marry what she had shot back in 1989 in 16 millimeter and um, shooting some of that, her interview in the same capacity and also shooting some of the um, reunion as Christine goes to find these exiles and where they live now um, and understand what the individual sacrifices for democracy actually are. So visual style, I would leave it up to them, but I think they did an incredible job um, just thinking through all of these things ahead of time. I'm still amazed and they're all first time filmmakers, um, but they all like basically were Christine Choi's students. So I'm also not surprised. <laughs> Eugene and Julie. Go ahead, Eugene. Oh, no, you can go ahead, Julie. I feel like I've been talking a lot. We're still, we, we still haven't figured out <laughs> the dance yet. Gotta work on that. Yeah, you can get to the point where you can finish each other's sentences. Like oh, that. no, we're there. It's not about finishing. It's about starting the sentences. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, one of the big challenges, of course, was that um, Charles Sully is no longer with us. He passed away in 2014, and um, as, as, as we sort of alluded to. And, you know, we were fortunate to have been able to collect a lot of archive. Um, we had the video footage, we had audio interviews that he'd done with KW, these painfully intimate and just um, just really open interviews that he recorded with KW during the 2000s, um, as well as his written memoir, um, which really detailed his life in prison in a way that even the activists who supported him and the people who knew him at the time had no idea about um, just what his day-to-day -day life was like when he was locked up. And so, you know, some of some of the the way the story got crafted, and we really have to give a lot of credit to our, our editing team, um, well, Aldo Velasco, Jean Chen, co-editor, Anita Yu, as well as our, our, our AEs, um, for really helping us kind of pare down um, what we had and be very intentional about which archival we used when, um, in order to create, from the archival perspective, a coherent picture of Chol Su. But um, really, it was the voice of Chol Su itself that we scripted that, um, that kind of 
was the 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 point when once we sort of were able to start a collab, this very fruitful collaboration to voice Chalsu, that's I think when his his story really took flight and his depiction really took flight. And I actually hear my daughter coming down, and you're going to hear a lot of three year old chatter in a second. So Julie, I think if you could tell that part of the story. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, like Eugene was saying, I think it was, you know, it was actually quite challenging to figure out how to tell this very complicated story about a very complicated man um, and this movement and then what happened in post-release. There's actually quite a lot of story. We have murder trials. <laughs> so there's also a lot of like court procedures um, to get through and major plot points, but then we never wanted to lose sight of the internal journey of Chosuli. We actually wanted that to be centered. It became actually hugely important for us to allow Chosuli to have agency to tell his own story. Who is the man? Who is the man behind the movement? Um, and so, yeah, Eugene was talking about like how we just felt like so insecure about it, though. Even as we immersed ourselves in all Chosu left behind and talk to like as many people uh, who knew him um, intimately as possible. Um, you always feel that insecurity because you never got to talk to him yourself. And, um, and then, yeah, crazy enough, you know, as we were looking for someone to be the voice of Chol Su Lee, um, you know, at first we thought we were gonna go with a, a Korean American actor, um, but that one, that didn't happen and then our, our brilliant producer, Sue Kim, she came up with this amazing idea and um, she had gone to an event for um, that documentary series, College Behind Bars. And um, it's, it follows um, incarcerated men and women who take part in the Bard, Bard Prison Initiative where they're, they're allowed to take college courses and um, earn their degrees while incarcerated. And one of the people at this event she went to uh, was featured in the film. His, his name is Sebastian Yoon. And, um, you know, he, he had been released from prison in, in 2019. And so he was talking about his film. He was talking about his own personal journey. And Sue said she was just so incredibly moved by him, his honesty, his openness. And there was something about him where she thought she could, he could voice Chelsea Lee. Um, and so she told us about it. Um, we reached out to him and he responded uh, pretty immediately and he was interested. Um, and, and then we, saw, we showed him a cut of the film and he was actually moved to tears, you know, um, upon seeing it. Uh, we sent him the published memoir of Chol Su Lee. He read it and he said he could so strongly identify with Chol Su's journey. Um, and, and, and so he started to work with us on actually revising the script uh, for, for the words that Chol Su Lee um, says in our film. And he just, he really, I know he gave me, uh, and I suspect Eugene too, it gave me a lot of peace actually when Sebastian became involved. Um, and, and Sebastian told us he actually felt like he needed to stand up for Chol Su Lee, who's not here to stand up for himself, to make sure like people can under, could just try to like listen to him and, and open their hearts and minds to understand how hard it was for him to live up to the expectations, even of the community that saved him, even as much as he wanted to, and even just to live a normal life after 10 years of incarceration, several of those years, you know, in, um, in, you know on death row. Um, and in solitary. And so Sebastian helped us, you know, really humanize Chosu. Um, and so I, I, it just felt like everything started to fall into place after his involvement. And, um, and really, I think that kind of emotional authenticity comes through in the film. And um, I think what's important to us too is, is that the love um, the love in our story like came through and um, it's the love of truth. It's the love of justice. And it's the love between Chol Su Lee and all these strangers who embraced him. So I think that 
I, I'm, I, I think our whole team is like really, really proud of that aspect of it. Yeah. Thank you. And I know, Shalini, we don't have too much time with you, so I'm going to segue a little bit. Um, if you, if you want to, you know, let folks know where they can catch your, your film next or, or, you know, what you're up to next. No, I just wanted to say what an honor it is to be on this panel in, in such astute um, company. And I'm so excited to see these other films and um, installations. And um, uh, that's really what, what I have to say. And um, I'm so grateful to be in conversation. Thank you for, for squeezing us in in a busy day. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. I want to bring this question to you, Michaela, kind of talking about, you know, your approach to uh, to filmmaking, but also, you know, since you are one of the projects here that is in that new frontier space, if you want to speak a little bit to, yeah, moving documentary storytelling beyond kind of this linear, linear um, format that we're, we're used to. Sure. Um, yeah, I think the incredible part about creating a more immersive or more interactive experience for your audience is that you allow them to tangibly feel the story in a way that maybe doesn't always translate in traditional film, right? So for us, we recognize that for me, especially with a background in filmmaking, I recognize that traditional filmmaking still does an incredible job of steering emotion and steering the opportunity for people to feel that there is an, a brighter future or an action they need to take. That being said, we also are moving quite forward and quickly into a more interactive, immersive entertainment environment for people, as well as for people on their day-to-day -day utility, right? Um, you know, you pick up your cell phone and you have 20,000 apps that can do 70,000 things via your touching of the apps, right? There's an interactive element that we are now becoming accustomed to. And I think that storytelling should still continue to feel that it can evolve just as photos evolved into film. I think film can evolve into virtual reality. And that's not to say there's not still going to be photographers and there's still not going to be filmmakers, but there can also be virtual reality creators now in the tr process of documentary filmmaking. And the important part to realize too, is that you get your audience purely focused and honed into where you are, right? You don't get to control the, the film still, right? You don't get to control scene by scene exactly what they're seeing. You sort of lose that as a filmmaker, that type of control. But what you gain is this incredible ability to have somebody be fully inside of your story by putting them inside of a physical headset, right? There's no place for them to escape and go when it feels uncomfortable. And that I think is a really important part of our process. We're not in on the morning you wake, we're not here to sensationalize the experience. We're not here to make the experience feel like a radical entertainment, but we are there to make sure you feel comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? We are there to make sure this is an uncomfortable moment and it could happen to anybody. And here's you witnessing it happening to people and not in like a very easy way for you to suddenly distance yourself from a film, right? Like you can finally, you can look at a film and distance yourself a little bit. This is a way of you being like, well, that happened to them, but maybe if that ever happened to me, you know, you kind of go through your whole mechanism of protection. And in virtual reality, sometimes you can take away that mechanism of distancing and protection because it can feel so intimate. It can feel so close. And it can also spatially be all around you, not just in the visuals, but also with the audio, which I think we do really well with this project as well, is the audio of where is what coming next, right? The feeling of the alert sounding all around you from right to left in sort of this like incredibly sonic way that you might lose that in a movie theater in some little bits. You might even lose that when you're watching a film on a computer. We sort of get to always have that high quality in, in virtual reality. Um, the ways that virtual reality has expanded and expounded the toolkit for documentary filmmakers is something I just wanna to touch upon really quickly as well. So 
when I started in VR documentary, the one thing we really had in the form of reconstruction and the form of true documentary was 360 filmmaking. You know, you could do artistic design, you could do CG graphics, you could do animation, but you didn't get the texture of real life. And since 2016, there's been a huge jump in something called volumetric capture and photogrammetry capture. And this is basically taking traditional film stills of photography or traditional like edits of film. And instead of making them into 2D, it can make it into 3D. So it basically can speak to volume. And that's one of the processes we used in On the Morning You Wake. So this was a pandemic production. Um, and we had to figure out interesting ways that we would recreate Hawaii without having to travel to Hawaii. The creators also had to figure out um, you know, creative ways on how to recreate the physicality and the movements and sort of the, the persona of the folks that they had online and audio based interviews with. And we were able to do that through volumetric capture. We were able to say, you know, this person, we could capture them like this or we can capture them like this. And so what you get is a real sense that these people have depth and volume as if you're playing a video game, but without the uncanny valley of, oh, this person's obviously just a CG recreated human, right? You get the actual essence of that person. Um, you're probably like, what is she talking about? Um, but what that means is for documentary filmmaking is that we can really do true life reconstruction and true life capture and optimize it for virtual reality storytelling. We can optimize it for augmented reality storytelling. We can optimize it for 3D models and truly create the scene, not just for a 360 camera, not just for a film, but also through like a real life video game set, which means that we can have so much more power in the way we create the stories as documentarians and not butt up against the old ethics of, well, is it really documentary if I'm just recreating it from a game engine? So that's my piece. Thank you for 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 giving us a taste of, of, of what you're working in and I'm so excited to continue these these types of conversations. Um, I, I want to kind of um, talk a little bit about yeah how you all worked with your your collaborators. I know a lot of you have collaborated with other um, ADOC members and so um, Maria do you want to do you want to talk uh, I don't know if Alex is here to join us but if you want to talk give him a little shout out. Yeah, well, I just wanted to first say I love being a part of ADOC. I was one of the lucky winners of going to Sundance in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. Um, one of three, Jewel was one as well, and Hong. Um, I don't know if she's out in the audience, but it was such an amazing introduction to Sundance for me. Um, and through this time, I've just been able to work with a lot of ADOC members. Um, Alex Margolin, I really want to shout her out because she did an incredible job with archival in this film. The film is heavy, heavy. I mean, sorry, no, it's not that heavy with archival guys. But she, there was a lot that she sifted through and she, she got the best for us. Um, so if you're out there, I want you to say something, Alex. Um, also, uh, we, the film that Christine had shot back in 1989 were following the three exiles and they were, it was all in Chinese. So um, our first task was to translate all of the material and understand what, what it was. Um, so we worked with uh, six translators all through ADOC. Um, and I just want to say really quickly, Xuan, Xuan Yu Pan, Joseph Liang, Sin Yu Chen, Alice Liu, Nikki Ren, and Ashley Chang. Like they have been watching this way before anyone can watch it. And I just don't even know anybody who could do a better translating job. So if, if you guys ever need a Chinese translator, you need to hit them up or hit me up. I know all of their emails. Um, so I, I guess all in all to say that ADOC has infused this project and has helped let it be what it is. So I, I sincerely thank you guys for all the work you do. And thank you. Eugene or Michaela, Julie? I mean, I, I mean, we spoke a bit about the collaborations we've had before. I mean, obviously, I mean, just to sort of pick up on on what Maria was talking about. I mean, um, there, I mean, there, there's a lot of sort of 
people who are part of ADOC and people who are adjacent to ADOC who are really instrumental in helping us get this through. I mean, when we started, it was really just Julie and I doing everything. We were doing the fundraising, we we're doing the research, we we're doing the producing. I was editing and filming um, and I'm not a cinematographer. So that's, that's not something that I, 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 I necessarily would want to do, but, um, but we were sort of really a small operation and um, we just feel really fortunate to be able to have gotten to a point where we could grow the team and then uh, that growth included a lot of ADOC members that we've mentioned already, Su Kim and Jin Chan. And um, <clears throat> this is this is where I wish I had written everything down in terms of who's in ADOC and who's not. Tammy but, Chu. Um, Tammy Chu. Tammy Chu did an incredible um, work. I did an, so, so much incredible work. Um, G.A. Kim was one of the AEs she, from early on who, who, who was wonderful. Mike Shum um, came on and filmed with us. Um, and, and hung out with KW for a day. And, and I think he came away for, changed by that experience as well, um, as, if one, as, as happens when you spend time with them. But we're just so fortunate to be able to have been able to collaborate with that kind of team of people. Because really, um, I mean, this is something that, that, that one of the activists said and that we've said a few times, but um, one of the activists sort of talked about the movement as being a chorus and not a solo. Um, and the title of his book in Korean is even like the song we sing together. And, it just really feels very much like this film was just the, the product of all of these people coming together. Um, and we just feel so, so fortunate and blessed for them to really be able to have lifted up this story. Thank you. Before we start opening it up to audience Q and A's, which I see there's some accumulating, so keep adding to that. Um, I would love if y'all can go around and just share some things you've learned from making your film um, or if there's any, advice you have for a first time filmmaker or somebody about to, you know, dip their toes into this filmmaking world. Maria, do you want to start? There's just so many things. I mean, I think, I think the main thing is to have a purpose. Um, because it will, making a film, as you guys all know, is very a long journey and it's a hard journey and many times. Um, and so I think to do documentary filmmaking of any sort, you have to have uh, a purpose in mind. And I think for me in this film, it was very easy and straightforward. Um, I went into documentary filmmaking without seeing a lot of um, people like me behind the camera. And so if, like I said, that, that has been my like guiding force throughout this whole thing. Um, yeah. And I, I think that everyone will have to figure that out in each of the projects that they do and try to hang on to it in some of the, the ups and downs, you know? Um, yeah, and I, I'm sorry, before I answer that question, I just want to make sure um, we give a shout out to Anita Yu, too, who was a co-editor and um, just uh, incredible, um, incredible talent. So, um, but yeah, like, there's just so much, there's so much we learned, <laughs> um, you know, for me personally, it just, I had a big learning curve because I was a journalist with absolutely no no filmmaking experience whatsoever. <laughs> um, so there was a hell of a lot to learn. Um, and I remember um, filmmaker Stephen Mang when we were at um, the Cam Camden Filmmakers Retreat, um, he, had, he said something to us about how like he feels like you should work on your film actually for a number of years, you know, almost like don't be in a hurry to finish it. And I can't remember exactly the number he gave, but I remember that by that point, Eugene and I had been working on the film for quite a number of years, <laughs> um, more, more than three, I believe, by that point. <laughs> and um, and it um, it it uh, it gave me some um, comfort and encouragement to hear that because he said, because you sit with your film longer, um, you can then gain the skill set you need to tell the story you want to tell. Um, and also, I think the story reveals itself to you more and more, you know, not that I'm saying every film needs six years, <laughs> but, but I, I did notice that for us, like, it was like peeling the layers of the onion to find 
what the story is that we wanted to tell because because it really could have gone in so many different directions. Um, and I think that's when, you know, for us, the, the truth was revealed. And, and I spoke of that heaviness earlier at the funeral. And, you know, for a long time, I thought it was the heaviness of um, K.W. Lee, the heaviness of these activists who felt this deep ache about, you know, things not having a happy ending for Chil Su Lee, and then he died. Um, but then I realized later that it was, the heaviness was partly Chil Su Lee's, and um, he, he needed that peace to know that, um, that although he's gone and in many ways his life was quite tragic and sad, um, that's not how he wanted to be remembered. And that he wanted to give the, a peace to all those, you know, who, who deemed him worthy of their time, care and compassion. Um, even as the rest of the society was saying he was disposable. And so I think that kind of truth and that kind of love then started to really inform this process. And um, I, you know, all I, really all of our team, as Eugene was saying, like that, that is like a, a big lesson I learned. It's like, of course, like you have to have the conviction in your own story to just keep pushing through um, as many years as it takes um, and all the self-doubt that you're that you're having to um, jump through, but really, it's like the team. The more people that came on to tell this story, which seemed like too big for us sometimes, but the more people that came on, um, and our team, like you know, Jean, Sue, uh, Sona, like even our, we had just everyone who's mentioned before Aldo. It's just then, oh my gosh, okay, we can we can do this. We can do this together, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I think, I think. Um, number one, believe in your your subject and be its strongest advocate. But then, number two, like make sure you bring on people who will embrace the story and like, and um, feel as passionate about it as you do. And just to build on that, I think, um, especially as first time filmmakers um, and as independent first time filmmakers, you're used to wearing a lot of hats. Um, you're used to trying to do everything yourself. You're used to trying to save money. And sometimes that means cutting corners. Sometimes that means working longer hours, what have you. But one of the real lessons I think that for me, um, I mean, I think I'm continuing to learn because one never one can never stop learning these important lessons is to not be afraid to ask for help and to just really know yourself well enough to know when you're at those moments where you need that help. Because again, I think we're also used to trying to do everything that sometimes it can be a little bit hard to hear that voice. Um, you just think you're going to gut through it, but, um, but really our story would not have gotten done if, if it wasn't for just this incredible team and for Kind of making space for people to be able to do that and to come in and help and contribute and i think those are all really important things that again i learned over the course of this time and i think i'm just continuing to learn as i just continue to um just grow with this project too and i just want to make sure also we shout out sorry this is becoming the shout out thing our our korean producer sona joe who was briefly mentioned who was incredible in terms of wrangling a lot of what was happening in korea as well as yun su her who was working with her there as well I would say fearlessness. Um, someone who is a part of this project that I have not yet have not yet mentioned is Dr. Jamaica Osario. And so basically when Archer's Mark, which is a team of people in the UK realized that they had to do this piece about nuclear threat based in the event on Hawaii, they realized that because they were sitting across the table with a collaborator who said, you know, last week I had a flood of messages in my inbox. And they were like, why? And she was like, because there was a false ballistic missile threat. And they know that I'm the expert in nuclear weapons who studies at Princeton University. And for 38 minutes, I had to decide whether or not I was going to tell them 
there's nowhere for you to go. Because I understand the impact that a real 20, like a, a, a nuclear ballistic missile that has been built to be launched in 2018, that it would have just decimated my whole island where I grew up and where I lived. And that was really important for us to recognize, right? Like this, these are real people. And for the UK team, they said, oh my gosh, we, ha we have to use this event as a lens because it's, it didn't happen very long ago, right? It's not gonna feel like something from the Cold War. This is something that happened in 2018. And what they didn't realize, especially as to, you know, middle-aged men that live in the UK is that Hawaii is built on top of militarism. The military occupation in Hawaii never left. It is been there and it continues to be there. And they were connected to Dr. Jamaica Osario who ended up being a lead writer and a lead collaborator and her spoken word poetry, which starts with on the morning you wake to the end of the world is literally the title piece of the experience, but it's also the spine of the piece that holds the piece together from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And the fearlessness that Jamaica speaks about militarism and the fearlessness that Tamara had in making herself vulnerable to say, you know, this event just happened to me last week while they were sitting on a call together, I think led to the fearlessness that brought this project forward, right? The fearlessness to say like, we're not going to try and, 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 you know, soften the edges around this project. We're not going to say in the impact campaign that we're trying to reduce the number of nuclear weapons or that we're trying to reverse nuclear policy. No, like fearlessness to say like, we are working to eradicate nuclear weapons from the world as it is known today, because there's already countries that have done it, because there's already a treaty from the United Nations that that actually mandates that nuclear weapons are now illegal because they are methods of mass destruction. And that the fearlessness that we're gonna continue this project with the idea that it's going to be at the Nobel Peace Center one day because Nobel Peace laureates for the first one was about nuclear weapons and disarmament, right? And the fearlessness to say uh, in our vision, like we're going to have a curriculum for high school students and we're gonna localize the experience in all these different languages, right? There's a fearlessness that I have felt since I've joined this team that constantly inspires me and constantly makes me say like, wow, like if I didn't feel conscientious to hide my dreams or to hide my visions or to hide what really matters to me or to hide what really upsets me, then like, can you imagine all the power that filmmakers and storytellers really could have, right? And so I would just say that fearlessness has been the biggest theme and topic that I've noticed. And as an impact producer, it's it's helped me feel supported to also be fearless in all the plans and ideas that we have. And of course, the next question is gonna be, well, Michaela, how are you finding funding? And I'm saying, you know, that's a part of that fearlessness where it's like, you know, the funding will come, we'll figure this out. Like everyone has pockets of money somewhere, right? And it might not come tomorrow, but it will come and we can continue to plan as if it is coming. And if we need to adjust, we'll adjust. And I think a lot of filmmakers and a lot of first time storytellers tend to plan with what they already have. And I think that limits us, right? You can always adjust to make your plan smaller, but why not start with the big dream to have your film at Sundance, to have your film at Tribeca, to have your film being distributed on Netflix instead of saying, well, you know, an online release would be really cool, right? So that's what I would say in my piece especially working in VR, you have to be fearless too. You're like, I, ah, people think I'm weird. <laughs> you have to be fearless to be like, no, it's cool, I promise. Amazing. Um, thank you all for sharing these wise words of wisdom. Um, so I'm gonna start jumping to some of the questions in the Q&A box. And thank you, Michaela, for, for typing out some of these as we're, on, as we're live. Um, I may actually still revisit some of those questions, um, but We'll, we'll start with one for, for Team Free Chosuli. So I'm going to fold these questions. So um, Eugene and Julie, what was it like kind of navigating the transition for you, Eugene, from editing to uh, directing? And then Julie, for you, from, you know, journalism to, you know, documentaries. Although, you know, they're, that, those lines are starting to blur a little bit quite often now. Um, I can start. Um, 
it was uh, initial. It was it, it was very helpful. I will say because I'm the cheapest editor I know, and so when something needed to get done, I could I could I could get that done, and that helped at every stage of the process in small ways. Um, that ultimately added did add up. Um, you know, I mean, I because you know, early fundraising samples, I was able to work on those all the way through to the end with like the sort of final deliveries um, and interacting with post houses. Like I was able to at least um, try and help be part of that and just try and be helpful for, for those conversations. But, um, but I also, we also um, realized at a certain point that we really needed outside voices because when you're this close to the material and you've been working on it for so long, the value of fresh eyes just grows and grows. And so just, again, so grateful to be, have been able to bring on other, other folks to, to help carry that load and really help craft the story in a way. Um, I, 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 feel like, I feel like one of the great things about this project, for me at least, has been that I feel like everybody, everybody on the team is better than me at something, which has been amazing to just be able to learn from so many people um, in, that, in that way. And so again, Aldo and, and Jean sort of helped craft the story and take it to a place where um, we, if like we could not have taken it to um, by ourselves. Yeah. Um, gosh, like I said before, there were so much, so much new things to, so many new things to learn. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think the part that was helpful being a journalist is. Um, is obviously the research and the reporting and the digging and just always trying to dig for the truth. And I think um, that is a common thing about um, journalism and um, documentary filmmaking. I think we're all searching for the truth and we're all um, committed to this principle about asserting this story needs to be told. And oftentimes this story by marginalized people needs to be told. Um, and I'm really proud actually that um, most of our team, uh, we are uh, people of color and um, many of us women. And I think um, that's something I'm really proud of. But um, yeah, it's, it's, but at the same time, cinema, cinematic language is very different than print journalism. It's hugely different. And so it was very hard for me in the beginning um, because I was like, oh, I think I know how to interview people. You know, I know how to do this, but it's sort of like, did you interview people and did you get like, did you get that moment? And you know, how, how you know, how was the lighting and how how did it come across? And maybe you felt it, but then if somebody sees it on a screen later, did they feel the same thing you felt in that moment? You know? And so I think it it was really um uh, it was it was quite a journey, I think, to learn all that. Um, sometimes I would see like a powerful quote in a transcription on paper and it'd be like, oh, but look at the footage, you know, and how is that spoken? And so it was just, it, it became, you know, Eugene taught me even a little, a little bit of Premiere and Avid so I could actually interact with the, <laughs> the footage more and then be like, okay, yeah, I need to, I need to pay attention to what, what's happening visually too. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was quite, it was quite the um, the learning curve for me, but I, I you know, the cra the crazy thing is, it's like um, I've come to, I've just come to appreciate just anybody who finishes a documentary film. I think it's a miracle. Um, I think it was Aldo Velasco, or, or, or one of our editors, who said, you know, he, he a filmmaker once told him like even finishing a bad film is hard. Um, that's quite an accomplishment. And I totally felt that um, because, wow, it's a, it's a marathon. It's a marathon of a journey. And, um, and um, but at the same time, like at the end, at the end, when you, when you give birth, I know like when, when I saw, um, you know, the finished film before we delivered it and the masters of archival had been cut in and the music from our, oh, our, our amazing composer I want to mention, Gretchen Jude. Oh, just, um, just really trans, tr that was transformative too, having her score. I, I was like in tears. I was just bawling my eyes out to, to see just, wow, like six years of that kind of labor, um, 
by a, this incredible team of people who each of them laid their hands on it and brought us some magic. And then, and then like when you see the final product, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I was, I was, I was uh, just blown away and, and full of gratitude. Um, for everybody, what changed most about your film's final structure um, or story that you didn't expect or, or plan for compared to when you first started? Um, is this for everybody or is this specific yeah, for, to for everybody, film? for everybody. So the project for our, for the virtual reality experience was, um, there was this huge plan to go to Hawaii and capture the mountains and capture the foliage. And then of course, set up a small soundstage and capture the folks that we were interviewing and collaborating with. And the pandemic shut all of that down. So in order to find a way around that, um, the filmmakers decided to cast very specific people that had the same sort of essence as the people they interviewed and do capture with them in the UK on a soundstage in the height of the pandemic. And they also had to recreate the Hawaiian beach from photos using photogrammetry software versus being able to just capture real life 3D sort of assets in real time. And I think that's like a huge, huge pivot that had to happen. And obviously, you know, you lose that essence of, oh, these are the real people, but you still gain the essence of like, these are people and the people were actually being played the audio in real time as they were doing the quote unquote performance, right? Like the, the parents running with the children's scene, like that is a real life scene that was like told to us. And a lot of people will come to me and say, well, isn't that unethical? And I'll say, well, is, is it the same or is it different than having, you know, your recreations with your actors when you create documentaries when you have to recreate those moments in those scenes to create the essence of the scene right and it's it's a fantastic subject and I don't think anyone has the right or wrong answers around it um, but that was definitely a huge um, pivot there was also a, a large question if we were going to reduce nuclear weapons or if we were going to really take the full de-weaponization stance in our in our public statements as well as in our impact campaign and we finally came to the point where we were like, we're not going to just please some people and try and say, oh, we're reducing weapons. We're going to say, no, like the end goal is to eradicate weapons. Like that's what our goal of the impact campaign is. Thank you. Um, I know we haven't, we, you know, uh, two of these projects here are, are archival base. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think so this question kind of related to all of that um, and just talking about uh, kind of stories that are unheard and unseen, but also disappearing and, you know, how, how lucky it was we have access to this archive. So what can we do now to collect these stories as a diaspora and also preserve and organize them for potential for future cultural contributions? I think Eugene, yeah, maybe you you can elaborate on this too. But I, like, uh, you know, for our film, we always talk about how there would be no film if not for the journalists and the documentarians um, of the past of that time period um, when our when when our story was taking place, and um, you know, Sandra Jin, a broadcast news journalist, uh, she's the one who made the first uh, documentary about this case back in 1983. And um, it ended with Chosu Lee's release. And um, had it not been for her work, uh, the work of other broadcast journalists um, at that time, and, and uh, Chris Chow, for example, Serena Chen, um, and also uh, Michael Chin uh, made a film whose archival we use. It's just, they, um, they not only fought to cover uh, a subject that um, their stations probably didn't have <laughs> a great interest in, but they also worked to preserve their own footage <laughs> because uh, believe it or not, news stations weren't going to be like, yeah, we def this is so important. Let's make sure we set this tape aside and save it. Um, and so um, 
you know, Eugene, you might want to elaborate more on this because I, I this is usually the question he he answers <laughs> in our press interview. So I don't want to I want to say too no, much. No, no, please, just, please um, keep going. But that, it's, you know, for especially for people of color histories, I'm sorry, there's like, you know, they could just stay buried, you know? And so it's it's like, really, we have to like, it has to be this assertive act where we're like, you know, we absolutely need to uh, put some money behind it too and make sure like um, that that this history is, is recognized um, and that it is properly preserved and, we're, we're, we're so relieved that, you know, in a lot of cases, like we, we were able to collect different things from people and digitize them, you know, as they were yellowing papers that are yellowing and falling apart tapes that were molding, you know, oh my gosh, <laughs> thank, thank goodness. And then, you know, that, that, that we were making this film now we could, we could try to like save them and preserve them. Um, so yeah, it, 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 like we have to, we have to do that as a community. And I, I, I worry that especially with, you know, the Asian American community, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're doing that enough. I don't know if we're, we're prioritizing that as a community. Um, and so we do need to like um, put the resources into it and not just talk the talk, but, you know, actually do something about this. And so at least we're grateful. I know you and I were grateful that we now we have all this incredible rich material digitized now and and that we can you know um donate and share it now um but um thank you know just thank goodness for the people who documented it and also thank goodness for people like kw lee and and the activists who also saved all their personal materials you know i'll just add that there's a through line i think of seeking out um, asian american journalists of past generations um just uh and and sort of what they've saved um i guess with i'm with the exiles as well to a certain extent and i'm, I'm sorry i haven't seen on the morning you wake Mikhail, but like you make the way you talk about it makes it sound so incredible like i just i just i just really can't wait to to be able to experience it um but i just want to i guess mention that and um and just the importance of i think you know speaking to like the, the older people in our lives. I think one of the things when we first started working on the film was because so many of the people in this film are older, like the first thing we knew we needed to do was to talk to as many of them as we could. Um, I mean, unfortunately, Jeff Adachi passed away. He was one of the younger ones, but it's like, you know, we're all constantly facing that um, to a certain extent. Um, and so, so to be able to even collect personal histories like that you have, I mean, I know for me personally, that's something that like I, have as a project for myself this year that I'm trying to make sure I do just make sure that for my in my own family that some of that is preserved. Um, because my parents sort of experienced the same period of time that Chol Su did and that KW did. Um, uh, it, it just sort of seems like it's it's just tremendously important to do that. And I think especially as Asian Americans, you know, you face this myth of the perpetual foreigner. And part of that is because our history is so buried or so erased. Um, I know growing up that was part of the power of seeing archival imagery of people who look like us, that it was just like, oh, wow, we existed here in a form that's recognizable. And it's different from like seeing something like that versus seeing something from, you know, the 30s or the 40s or the 50s from Korea, for example, because there isn't that separation of language, of geography and of experience. And so because of that, it just sort of feels like this is a community project, really. And we hope that pro films like ours can spur folks to just sort of find the, the hidden stories and the hidden histories in their own lives, that in their own communities, wherever they are and to help bring those forth, because there are a lot of stories, incredible stories in our communities that just don't get told. Yeah, just to jump off that really quick too, um, what Eugene and Julia were both saying, you know, this film wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for um, Christine Choi paying years for um, this footage to be stored, right? And protected because it did need to be digitized. And it took, um, also a connection with Ang Lee in order to get it digitized at all, right? And so there is this faith that you have to have in your own footage that this can will go somewhere. And I don't know, like that timing could be 30 years later as it is today um, for Christine Choi's footage, but what it has instilled in me is to understand that my own footage, like what you were saying, Eugene, I'm trying to do my own personal project too, and 
being able to know my history, right? And say it's worthy of being stored. Um, and I think that's what we can all do and what we all should do. Cause one day there could be someone knocking on your door looking for that exact footage. So. And I could say, speaking as someone who works in the like future technology or the technology that feels like it's from the future, like the more that you can keep that footage as you know, digitized or what we would call future-proofed in our industry as possible. It might not be a traditional documentary. It might not even be a virtual reality documentary. It could be, you know, you took six images of someone's dish and you can create that into a 3D model that can be like scanned and placed in someone's home in real time, right? Like when they're trying to get to know more about you or get to know more about your family. And so just know that like, it might not even live as the way that you might envision it now. It could have a lifetime process that lives on into a world that you wouldn't even know existed, but because you have the, the baseline material, you have the, the photos or you have the film clip or you even have the film clip digitized, like it allows there to be asset particles for people who work in technology to also work with. So yes, and please, and thank you, because that is one thing I wanna see more of is more, obviously this project has a, a vast universe, universal pool. It's not specifically Hawaiian and indigenous, but it has that feature. But like the, the things I wanna see more is like a fully immersive 3D rendered, multi-million dollar project that just hones and focuses on an, a purely Asian American story. Like Randall Okita did one called Book of Distance about his family and the Japanese internment. And it's one of the most celebrated, if not one of the only celebrated Asian American based documentaries that is a virtual reality experience. And like, my goal is to see more of those happen. And my goal is to see more of us at Sundance and Tribeca and in the new frontier category. And if you have the baseline material to start with, that's all we need to like, create something more and something broader and something more immersive and more interactive as well. I know we don't have super, we're, we're running out of time here. So I'm gonna breeze through um, some of the questions. Um, this is a great question that Victor just typed in. Um, in kind of related to the fearlessness you talked about, Michaela, um, it involved with involve, evolving your story to include the myriad of documentary to do story scope funding team members. What can you say about the process you would prioritize more for your next or future films and striking the balance of both educating those that may not get AAPI issues versus staying true to the subject or your film's POV? It's always going to be the question of who your audience is, right? Are you creating a film that's supposed to service the audience that needs a lot of context to understand that specific narrative? Or are you going to create, I think of like a film like Encanto, which most of that Spanish that were just most of this, like I watched it in English, but most of the Spanish, even the Spanish music wasn't necessarily translated, but that didn't take away my ability to identify with those characters, right? There was sort of this underlying of like, you're watching a film about based in Colombia, based in Colombian like mythos, there's gonna be a ton of Spanish and you're just gonna hop in and jump in and go for the ride. And so they they understood like their, their audience that they wanted to serve was a dual audience. And they also wanted to recognize that that audience didn't always need the tricycle sort of like training wheels to hop on board like a Spanish speaking family, right? So. I always go back to who's your audience and I'll always go back to like, who are you trying to serve with creating this? Are you serving the person you're collaborating with and being like, we're going to tell a fearless story about who you are, or are you servicing like a more educational approach for a broader type of people? Or are you servicing like a celebration of the Asian American community? It's really a question for you as a creator of, of how you want to approach. That's my sense. This is not necessarily in relation to a future project, but just in, in relation to Free Chul Su Lee. I'll, I'll say this, and I, I, I said this um, recently at the APEN event, so I apologize that I'm repeating it now. But, um, you know, we knew our film um, would have such import to the Asian American community in particular. And, um, and we had this huge responsibility 
uh, to, to write history and make sure this history was known. Um, but I'll say that I, I think once um, Don Young from CAM like um, really um, always advised us to sort of let go of that and tell the story that you guys want to tell. Um, I think that liberated us quite a bit. Um, and so I think it's important um, it's important as you're balancing everyone and, and your audience. It's like, I think it's just also really important to, to stay true to why you're making this film, um, what was at the root of it. And, um, and, and um, yeah, and, and, and honestly, um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes what you find is it's something quite spiritual and um, that's what we found in our case. And um, it was really, I, 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 I thank Jean Shen um, who came in and brought the, the film home because I feel like she made, a, um, she made that spiral connection with our subject, um, with Chul Su Lee. And that's why um, the, you know, we were able to, I think, come out with the film that we did that, um, as I was saying earlier, I think, uh, is just um, foregrounded in a lot of um, respect, a, a lack of judgment for our subjects, um, uh, seeing it through a compassionate lens and making sure that um, just the love of the story came through. Um, like I said earlier, the love of truth, the love of justice and, and the love shared between Chul Su Lee and, and everyone who, um, who embraced him. So um, I think you really do have to um, in the darkest hours of the night, really think about like how the story you want to tell and, and staying true to that. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I share so much love with all of you here at the panel. And thank you so much for all of our attendees for your great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we're so excited. We're looking forward to seeing your 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 films out there in the world. Um, and for everybody, please, you know, sign up for our newsletter. Check our website. We're so excited to share what ADOC is going to do next. It's going to be an awesome year. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. And a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ADOC. Thank you, fellow panelists. Such an honor. I'm here. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>